Good morning, family. How you doing? It's good to be together, friends online. It's good to be here. Hey, it's just us today. Feel all right? Just me and the piano and you guys. So uh, we're all joined together, uh, not in the same room, but under the banner of Christ. And let's just join our hearts around this piano and around praises for our Lord. So why don't we stand? And I'll offer up this psalm as our call to worship. I will extol the Lord at all times, says the 34th Psalm. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together.
love, heal and forgive. He bled and died to buy my pardon and the empty grave. To prove my Savior lives And because He lives I can face tomorrow Now, something about that song. Um, and you know what? Why don't you go ahead and have a seat? I think I might talk for a second. I want you to be standing up all through that. But I happen to know the folks that wrote this song, a husband and wife team who are really dear to me. And this song was birthed and drenched in hope from the get-go. They actually wrote it uh, when they had their son, Benji. And the first verse when they sing it is, um, how sweet to hold a newborn baby. Then they wrote it for the masses with um, just a beautiful lyric about how God sent his son for us. And the lyric of, of because he lives, I can face tomorrow because he lives, all fear is gone because I know he holds the future and life is worth a living just because he lives. Those lyrics are just bathed in hope. The melody is outstanding, but I know a little bit further in, that Bill Gaither baked some hope into the underpinnings of the chords. And I don't know, I'm gonna get a little uh, music geek uh, on you right here, uh, if that's okay. You may or may not know there's, there's, um, there's something called a major chord, and it's this. We've all kind of heard that. Maybe we knew what it was or we didn't. That is, you write in a major key when you wanna be happy. Then there's the minor key, minor chord. You kind of write in that key when you want to be sad. Then there's some, there's some notes you add on to those to kind of uh, uh, add to the experience of the chord. And there's something called the dominant seven, and it sounds like this. And when I play that chord, some of you thought, hey, that sounds happy. And some of you thought, hey, that sounds cheesy. Now, they are both, and we have gotten away from using this chord, but I'll tell you, it's very happy. Uh, yes, it's cheesy, it's joyful, and it's also hopeful. It just depends on how you use it. And Bill put that chord all the way through here to underpin this song, this hopeful lyric with hopeful chords. Now, we've gotten away from using this chord. Uh, we now would probably sing that song like this. It would be, um, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because now, and this is, no, this is no treatise on current music, but we use those four chords to write all of our songs. But back in the day, we used other things. And let me just show you what I mean. Because he lives, and I'll point them out, like right there. I can face tomorrow because, boom, right there. He lives, all fear is gone. And right there, because I know, I know he holds the future all the way down right here. And life is worth the right here living just right there because right there he lives. So now that you know that this song is, yeah, 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 yeah. It's pretty fun, right? It's all over the place. So now that you know that not only is the melody great, and the words point to hope, but this thing is birthed in hope and bathed in hope. So sing it one more time with me. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow.
Now, same hope, different experience, okay? Our hope's still in Jesus here from a different angle. And you may know this story, you may not, but uh, in the late 1800s, there was this family and a man and his wife, Anna, and they had five kids. And he was a wealthy and successful lawyer businessman in Chicago, but in 1871, uh, their son, their only son, succumbed to pneumonia, and he passed away. And at that same time, the United States was going through kind of a financial crisis, and his business really tanked, along with many other businesses. But a couple years later, um, his business began to thrive again, so much so, and they'd been through some really rough times, obviously, they decided to celebrate by uh, taking a trip to Europe. Um, but he wouldn't be able to go with his family right away. He had some other things to take care of with the business, and he would follow them a few days later. So they boarded, uh, his wife and four daughters boarded a ship and headed out across the Atlantic to go to uh, Europe. But about four days into their journey, their ship collided with another ship and sank very quickly. Um, and Anna, the mom, was the only one of them that survived. And she was picked up by a, uh, a fishing vessel. Uh, and then uh, she was transferred to another vessel that carried her the, west, the rest of the way to Europe. And when she finally got there, she sent a telegram to her husband, Horatio, that said, I'm saved alone. What should I do? Well, Horatio got a ticket immediately. He was crushed and uh, started out across the sea to see his wife and comfort her and be by her side. Well, the captain of the ship that he was on knew the story of what had happened. And so four days into their journey, he summoned um, Mr. Spafford, Horatio Spafford, to, to him out on the deck and said, hey, this is about the spot where the ship went down. And um, he was on the edge of this, uh, deck at about the gravesite of his children and this businessman this lawyer who had just lost uh, a lot and was grieving wrote these words from a place of hope when peace like a river attendeth my way when sorrows like sea billows roll Whatever my lot Thou hast taught me to say It is well, it is well with my soul Let's stand together and sing it is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. And though Satan should buffet, though try. for 
my soul and it is well with my soul My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. Yes, my sin, not in part, but the whole. He is nailed to the cross, and I bear. things.
can unforeseen kiss And my heart turns violently inside of my chest And I don't have time to maintain these regrets When I think about the way Sing it. Oh. And when I was growing up, we sang it like this. Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you As he gave his life, what more could he give? Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves you and me. Sing it again. Oh, how he loves you. He gave his life. What more could he give? Oh, how he loves you. Say, yeah. Just as. I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to Just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blood to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God, I come. Oh 
come wounded to be healed. I come desperate to be rescued. I come empty to be filled. I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb. And I'm welcome with open arms. Praise God. Just as I am. Let's go to God, friends. We are welcomed with open arms. Praise God, just as we are. And you don't just wait for us to fall into your arms. You come running towards us. And we are so grateful because some of us feel like we can't take a step. That we're mired in questions and we're weighed down with grief in life. Sometimes life just hurts. Help us to remember, God, that you take care of us and that you love us. God, please be our refuge. And we ask right now for the miracle of replacing our distress with your peace. You as our strength when we feel weak and find it hard to carry on, that we would not fear the future, but trust that you are in control when our emotions plunge us down and when we are in despair. And in the times when we can't speak, and we don't know what to say. God, help us to be still and know that you are God. And we will give you the glory in all things. And we pray this in the name of your precious son, Jesus. And the church said? Amen. 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 It's great to worship with you this morning, church. Just go ahead and take a seat. A church family, before Pastor Josh comes to share a message with us, I want to plant a little seed in your mind. It's something special that's coming our way this Thursday evening. It's an invitation to join us and spend time with longtime friends of Northland Church, the Kiev Symphony Chorus and Orchestra. And now we, uh, as believers, have brothers and sisters in Christ in both Ukraine and Russia, but this is a chance to witness and be a part of what God is doing in Ukraine. He is opening doors for this group to share the gospel and to help rebuild communities. So let's take a look at this video and then let's welcome Pastor Josh. In the spring of 1993, gifted conductor and musician Roger McMurrin and his wife Diane sold their Florida home and made a personal 10-year commitment to share great Christian classics of the West with the Ukrainian people. They taught the classics, such as Handel's Messiah, which were essentially unknown during 70 years of communist oppression. The McMurrins also envisioned bringing employment and international exposure to the world-class musical artists in Kiev. Today, the Kiev Symphony Orchestra and Chorus is known internationally and has made countless recordings. KSOC is part of Music Mission Kiev, which uses sacred music to spread and share the gospel with Ukrainians. Yet God has called us to much more than music. MMK has developed outreach programs that serve both body and soul, meeting physical needs and offering promises found only in Jesus, including widows in search of humanitarian help and hope, orphans and children longing for care and connection, internally displaced and wounded people in pursuit of healing and shelter. New opportunities for sharing the gospel and rebuilding Ukraine are presenting themselves every day. Under the leadership of conductor Vika Konchakovska, 30 brilliant women from KSOC will perform various music, including sacred classical masterpieces, Ukrainian folk songs in costume, and contemporary sacred jazz works. Join us for an unforgettable experience from this exceptional group of world-class musicians. Good morning, Northland. 
Yes, it is good to be with you. Good to be back. I was in Brazil last weekend visiting one of our missions partners, and they are reaching people deep in the Amazon. And that was the coolest thing. Now, I didn't go deep into the Amazon, so I got to hang out with the church leaders who are deep in the Amazon and got to participate in their missions conference. But I missed you, as I always do. And I'm glad that we have two Dans that gave you Dan Talks, discourses about next gen, and they knocked it out of the park. So I hope you see that here at Northland, we deeply, deeply, deeply love the next gen. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to 2 Corinthians. While you're turning to 2 Corinthians, I want to welcome all of those of you who are joining us online. So our Ponce Inlet Home Church, Bridges of America, and Seminole County Jails. Will you just give it up for our online Northland family? So as you know, we are in our series, Iron Faith. Now, I know you're probably thinking, at least some of you, uh, what's this bike doing up here? And so I'm going to explain what this bike is doing up here. But, but before I kind of jump in, how many of you, you know what zone training is? You, you know what zone training is? Okay, yeah, you know, quite a few of you. And so for those of you who do not know what zone training is, I'm actually going to show you what zone training is because when I was training for my Ironman, I actually learned actually what zone training was and I had never learned really about this. I worked out, but I just didn't understand zone training. So let me just show you what zone one is. Now, oh, here's what I forgot. I forgot because I'm, I'm so excited about jumping on my bike. Uh, because zone training all it has to do with your heart rate. So I have my phone connected to my Garmin. Now this is not an endorsement for Garmin. They are not paying me for this, but I have a Garmin watch. And so I want you to focus on my heart rate because zone training has everything to do with your heart rate. So let me show you what zone one is. All right, so if I can get my little foot in the holster. So zone one is a very easy light intensity. So you do this when you are warming up, you're cooling down. And to be honest, I could actually preach the entire message from zone one. Now I'm not going to do that because my, my, my rear would, would actually get, get tired. So, I, so I'm not going to do that, but, but zone one, very light. Now here's what we like as human beings. We, we would love if we could live in zone one. Could you imagine what life would be like in zone one? Oh, this is easy. Life is so easy. Life is a dream. Life, I mean, like that, that's what it would be in zone one. But, but we know that life is not just lived in zone one. We actually have zone two. Now, what, what is zone two? Well, zone two, it actually builds endurance. Like when you're actually in an Ironman race, you're typically going to be uh, swimming, biking, running in zone two, zone three. So that's at when you are doing a race. So uh, women, when you are walking briskly with a friend, you're able to have a conversation and you all are in zone two. Uh, the minute that you cannot have a conversation, you have just exited zone two and you're probably in zone three. But even in zone two, I could preach the entire message because I could just do this all day long. And then as you could tell, where's my heart rate? So 128, yeah, that's right about zone, zone two. Now I'm gonna kind of get up to zone three. Now this is your moderate level. So it improves aerobic fitness. So this is where it really is now doing something with your heart and it's a steady state. Now, here's the thing, you can go a long distance in zone three but you're going to start losing kind of your breath. You're not going to be able to have a full on out conversation because you are moderately exerting yourself. You're, you're starting to sweat a little bit. It's starting to strain. Just a tad, where's my heart rate at? Okay, 132. Let's see if I can get it up to like 140, you know, for you. Uh, let's see where my heart rate is here. Okay, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. So that's zone three. Zone four, let's get to zone four. Let's see what zone four looks like. So it's going to improve your anaerobic. How many of you, you've heard of a threshold run before, or a threshold ride? So what a threshold run or ride is, is that you're going all out as fast as you can, as hard as you can for 20 or 30 minutes. And that threshold, that's as far as you can go, it's as far as hard as you can go in 20 or 30 minutes. And so, uh, I'm trying to get there right now. So I'm gonna pause and see if I can get there. But here's another thing about zone four. You start to feel 
the burn. You knew what that burn is. So here's zone five. Let's get to zone five. How about we get to zone five? Oh, you see, you see my, you see my heart rate? 170, baby, 170. You can do it, pastor. We know you can. Don't kill yourself. So I'll stop. Zone five. Let me catch my breath. It's so funny to see the anaerobic workout that I'm getting preaching. It is fun. So these zones in our exercise, they actually have great application in our lives. Because we would like to live in zone one, but as a fantasy, that's not gonna happen. So what does zone two, what does zone three look like for the Christian? Now, let me show you a chart that many of you are familiar with because we've looked at it in this series. You have the kingdom of man, prototype, Egypt, Babylon. You have the kingdom of God, promised land. Jesus comes into the kingdom of man to save, to ransom a people for himself. And then you have the true church, the false church. So there are people who profess the name of Jesus, but they aren't followers of Jesus. But the true church, those who are truly followers of Jesus, they are maturing more into the image of Jesus as they head towards the promised land, as they head towards the new city. Now again, this middle ground, that's the wilderness. That's where we are right now. We're, we're not in the new city yet. We're in the wilderness where there's gonna be trials and difficulties. And so you need to understand kind of where we are now. How does zone training, how does it impact this life right here? Well, let me show you. Let me take take you to the next slide. So I've just kind of blown it up for you. Again, Christian maturity. But then you have zone one all the way to five. So what's zone two and what's zone three for the Christian? Well, I'm glad that you asked. Let me show you. All right, so zone two, zone three, you're going to be happy. Uh, you, you might even moderately exert yourself and you might start sweating just a little bit. I forgot to bring my hanky today. Uh, but when, when you think about zone two, zone three for the Christian, I want you to think about spiritual disciplines. Now we've talked about spiritual disciplines already in this series, how what we've done here at Northland is we've broken them down to connect, cultivate, care, and commission. Let me show you. So connect, and you have all these spiritual disciplines under connect, Bible intake, you're meditating, prayer, confession, fasting, silent solitude, corporate worship, learning, journaling, Christian fellowship, discipling under cultivate, stewardship, serving, caring. I would even add a third, and that's resting. And then commission is exemplifying Jesus, inviting people to Jesus, sharing your testimony. Those are all spiritual disciplines. And they fall under zone two and zone three. Maybe some of you today, it was really hard for you to come to corporate worship. But you said, you know what? I'm going to exert myself and I'm going to go. You've entered into zone three. When you are with others in your work and you're like, man, I really don't want to serve Rick. He's a jerk. But you're like, you know, here's what Christ would have me to do. Like you're, you're moderately having to apply yourself in zone three through these disciplines. So I want you to think of these disciplines as zone two and zone three. Now remember, zone two, you're constantly doing it. You could do this for a very long time. Even zone three, you, you are exerting yourself. You're exerting energy. You might even start breaking a sweat, but you could do that for a long time, for a long time. All right, so you're like, all right, well, Josh, what's, what's zone four and zone five? I'm glad that you asked. That's where you feel the burn, baby. You're gonna feel the burn. Tell your neighbor, feel the burn. Feel the burn. That's where you, you almost die. You're like, I can't do it anymore. And notice I have the cross now tilted because that's where pain and suffering enter in with the Christian. Pain and suffering are our zone four and zone five. And what we will see today is that we need pain so that we might go the distance. So here's the main point that we are going to flesh out. You ready for the main point? Say you're ready. Here's the main point. We'll say it in three different ways. Fire forges faith. So when I'm in zone four and zone five, I am feeling 
fire. My thighs are on fire. But what it's doing, it is forming legs of steel, baby, so that when I'm pedaling and I'm trying to ride my bike 112 miles, I'm going to do it because it's forging something in my legs. And then suffering strengthens salvation. So I'm telling you, I don't like zone four. You don't either. I don't like zone five. You don't either. But something in suffering is strengthening. And for the believer, it's strengthening salvation. And then pain produces perseverance. And so what I'm hoping, what I'm hoping and praying, I've been, I've been waiting over a year to preach this message because every single one of us, we need this message. And here's what we need to do. We need to reframe our pain, all right? We're gonna reframe our pain. On the count of three, I want us all to say that. Ready? One, two, three. We're gonna reframe our pain because that's what the Bible is going to do. So with that, will you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word? I'm gonna tell you, I'm bringing it this morning. I'm going to bring it. Is you going to make me sweat like that? I'm, I'm going to make you sweat. Just, just playing. All right, here we go. Here's what Paul writes in Romans. Not only so, but we also glory in our what? We see sufferings as weighty and significant because we know that suffering produces what? This is in the word, y'all. And perseverance produces character, and character, hope. So that's what Paul says in Romans 5. But here's what he also writes in 2 Corinthians. But we, believers, Christ followers, have this treasure in jars of clay. So you and I, we are a jar of clay. We're very fragile, we are weak, but we have a treasure above all treasures. And what treasure is that? Jesus in our hearts. The life of Jesus in our life. So we have this treasure in jars of clay to show this all-surpassing power is from God, not from us. That what is emanating from our life is actually from above, not from within. So we are hard-pressed, Paul says, on every side, but we ain't crushed. We're perplexed, but we sure is not in despair. We're persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus. And anytime you see these two words right here, so that, always ask the three-letter word, why? So let's, let's do that. On the count of three, we're all going to say why. One, two, three, why? Okay, why? So that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. Then he goes on. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake. Why? So that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. That somehow, in some way, in our suffering and in our dying, Jesus is producing life in somebody else. Woo! Woo! So verse 16, here it is. Therefore, we do not lose. Let me tell you what that is. It's like when you're in zone four, in zone five, and you want to quit peddling, you want to quit living, you want to throw in the white towel, Paul says, don't lose heart. We don't lose heart as believers, as Christ followers. When we are in zone four, zone five, we keep going. We keep peddling. God's doing something. So we're not going to lose heart, guys and gals. Though outwardly we are wasting away. I know you getting old. I can see it. I know when you get up, you got that arthritis. I'm just wasting away. I know. And it's not wasting away in Margaritaville. I know. You're getting old. But inwardly, we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us. An eternal weight that outweighs them all. So here's what we do then. So we fix our eyes on not what is seen, but what is unseen. You do realize that the Christian is living for what they cannot see. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Consider it. This is what James says. This is a the half-brother of Jesus. You say, why was he a half-brother? Because Jesus, his father, was God. And James' father was Joseph. That's why he was the half-brother. 
but consider it pure joy. Oh, no, he didn't. Because he tells us to consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds. So when you're in zone four, zone five, you ought to be like joyful. You ain't got to be happy about it, but you're joyful about it. Why? Well, because you know that the testing of your faith, that suffering, that pain that you're experiencing, is a test of your faith. It produces perseverance. So let perseverance finish its work so that you may, you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Let's pray. Father, may you be glorified. Jesus, may you be magnified. May you be the center of this message. May you be the center of our lives. And Spirit, I pray that you would help us all to reframe our pain. And that we'll see and we'll leave different because we know that you're doing something in our pain for your gain in our life. For it's in your name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. All right, let's see where my heart rate is. 142, Lord have mercy. I'm gonna have to settle down. You know, some of you are like, how can you preach that long? I'm in zone three most of the time. I can go all day. <laughs> Sorry, I won't make myself. Anyways, <laughs> well, tickle myself. Here we go. So here's what we're gonna do this morning. We're gonna look at three truths about pain with regards to endurance. So three truths about pain that's gonna help us reframe our pain with regards to endurance. Truth number one. So pain is needed to produce endurance. <clears throat> we saw that in Romans 5, 3. We know that suffering produces perseverance. James writes that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Now, I don't know if you remember, but the very first message in our series, Iron Faith, we looked at Matthew 13 and the parable of the sower or the parable of the soils. And there were four different types of soil. Now, one of the soils, uh, they were rocky. And so when the seed, when the gospel seed, when the message of the good news of King Jesus fell on this seed, it actually sprouted up, but it was scorched because of the rocky soil. There, there was no depth. There was no fer fertile ground there. And when Jesus was explaining that soil is that when pain and suffering come into the life of that person who believes that they are saved, they fall away because of pain and suffering. So I want us to realize that when pain and suffering come in our life, we either go one or two directions. And here they are right here. They either, so when pain and suffering come into our life, they either lead to the exit of the faith or the endurance in your faith. So there's one or two directions that people will go when they face pain and suffering in this world. They will either run away from God or they will run deeper into God. So ask yourself, where, where am I running? What direction am I running when I encounter pain and suffering? But where do I go when I find myself in zone four or zone five? Do I run to the Father? Do I run away from Him? Because, as James and Paul is telling us, is that when pain and suffering come in our life, that's a test. It's testing of whether or not you're passing as a believer or you're failing that you've never believed. Now, just so that we are on the same page, what is pain and suffering? So if you're looking at pain and suffering as one whole, I want to separate out the departments or the divisions of pain and suffering, just so that we're on the same page of what pain and suffering is. And so here, here's the list right here. These are, these are six divisions or six departments of pain and suffering. Disappointments and discouragements. Let me ask you this. How many of you, you've been disappointed or discouraged at some point in your life? That's pain and suffering, congratulations. But we go through, think about it, we go through discouraging and disappointing times almost daily, do we not? So when you're driving on I-4 and, and, and that sucker doesn't let you in, you're disappointed that you are not a nice, nice human being. I wanna give you the bird, but Jesus is telling me all to pray for you. I mean, again, that, that's a disappointment. Uh, you might have a disappointment, why'd you give Susie a raise and not me a raise? 
Oh, why, why, why does my boss never recognize me? And so you might, you might get discouraged. I want you to know when those discouragements and disappointments come into your life, that's pain and suffering, and that's producing something in you. Uh, think about discipline. Now, we know this well in our homes. We typically discipline our children for misbehaving. And I want you to know that your heavenly father disciplines you as well. He chastises you, he rebukes you, he disciplines you when you sin. But there's two types of sin. There's sin, there's sins of commission, meaning that you know that you're sinning, you just don't care. And when that happens, God's gonna bring pain and suffering in your life to discipline you so that you will stop doing that which is disobedient to him. But then there are sins of omission. You don't even, I don't even know that, that we're doing them. Those are blind spots. And that's what happens in Christian maturity. The more we grow into our image and likeness of Jesus, the more we become aware of sin in our life that we might not have known about when we came to faith. And so things might start happening in your life so that you might go deeper in Jesus and go, you know what, I don't need to do that anymore. That the way I'm behaving, which is sinful, is, is actually tied to my, my, my fallen nature. Like, I, I, I didn't know that, but now I do. And that was made, made possible because of the Lord's discipline in your life through pain and suffering. And then difficulties. Man, I mean, let me just, I, I know the answer, but is life difficult? Uh, let me, uh, ask you, uh, is life difficult? Yeah, because it ain't zone one. I tell you that. Like, actually, there are a lot of thorns and thistles in our life. Like if, you, if you've been married, I mean, even if, you are, even if you are engaged, your relationship's already difficult. Like I was meeting with a young couple yesterday and they were talking about premarital counseling. I, I, and what I tell them is that, hey, we're just warning you about what's coming down the line. We're war warning you about all the difficulties that you're going to face. Like I get marriage is difficult. Parenting is difficult. Vocation and work, difficult. That's why we see in Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve sinned, one of the consequences was thorns and thistles. So life is just one big, thorny, difficult situation. And that, that is pain and suffering that has come into our life to produce perseverance, uh, discomfort and dissatisfaction. There are times where I got a lot of dissatisfaction because there is moments where I have to sit in the discomfort of, you know what, I am not the husband I need to be. I'm not, I'm not the dad I need to be. Instead of trying to run away from that discomfort, I need to press into that discomfort and ask myself, what is God teaching me about myself and about who he is? There are times where I feel like I'm an inadequate pastor. How can I shepherd better? And so I have to sit in that dissatisfaction and then despair. Maybe some of you, you came and you are in despair right now. And here's the characteristics of despair. You can't breathe, that you've lost all control. I prayed with a family just, just two weeks ago. Uh, the wife got the news that she has brain cancer. Can't solve that. And I'm sure, actually I know, it took the wind out of them. Maybe when you lost your spouse, Maybe when you lost your child, despair hits in, this hopelessness, and you can't breathe. And then, death. Now, I'm not just talking about physical death, because maybe there's some of you in here, years ago, you, you got a, a divorce, and it was nasty, and so the death of a marriage, it was painful. Maybe you're, you're, you're a teenager, and you're, you're going through a broken home, and you're angry, you're upset because of the death of your household. Maybe you had to declare bankruptcy. I, I don't know. It could be an other relationship where you experience death. It could be a termination, and you experience death, or it could be physical death. You see, these are the departments of pain and suffering. And just so that we know, Paul went through every single one of them. Let's read what he says. He says this in 2 Corinthians 11, I've worked much harder. Now, what was interesting about 
his letter to the church at Corinth was that they looked at Paul's life and they're like, you go through way more suffering than you actually see success. What's wrong with you? And so they started to question his apostleship. They started question, questioning his leadership because they saw him suffer more than succeed more. And here's what he's like. I've worked much harder than anyone else for the glory of King Jesus. But I've been in prison more frequently. I've been flogged more severely. I've been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. So do the math for those mathematicians, 39 times five. I can't do that really quick. But three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move is what Paul says. I've been in danger from rivers. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is like Lord of the Rings stuff right here. Like well, the rivers just rise up. I'm gonna attack Paul. I mean, that's what I'm kind of thinking. I've been in danger from bandits, danger from fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city. So if I go to the urban center, I'm in danger. If I go to the villages and the tribes, I'm in danger. I'm in danger at sea. I'm in danger from false believers. I've labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I, and I love my sleep. I'm like, ha, Paul, how'd that happen, man? But, but I've known hunger and thirst. I've gone without food. I've been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Paul's life was one of pain and suffering. Here's the, uh, here's the principle. You and I need pain. Sit in that for a second. You and I need pain. Now, I'm not telling you that tomorrow morning you wake up and go, where's that pain? God says, I need pain. I'm going to go find pain. No, I'm not telling you that. I'm not, and you don't need to be a pain junkie. You don't need to be a pain seeker. Listen, life's full enough with pain for you to go seeking it. All right? So that's not what I'm telling you to do. But what I am telling you, based upon the authority of God's word, you and I need pain to produce perseverance. All right, let me give you an example. All right, let's say tomorrow you wanna go, you wanna go to the doctor and you're gonna, get a, you're gonna get a health checkup. They're gonna put your tail on that scale and they're gonna write down your weight. And I know, like you're gonna be like, and then they're gonna do a lot of blood work. They're gonna do a lot of tests. Then the doctor's gonna come in and they're gonna sit down with you. Yeah, I'm looking at your numbers. You know, you're not, you're, you're not the healthiest person. You're like, I know, doc, I know. And then they're going to say, well, you need to lower your cholesterol. You need, you need to do some things to get healthier. And you're like, I know, doc. And so again, you're in this state of health right here. But you want to be here, so does your doctor. There's a gap. Let me tell you what that gap is. That gap is the gap of pain. Because, yeah, y'all know it. I even got to explain it. You know it. And then here's another example. Let's go, let's just say you, you wake up tomorrow, you want to sit down with the financial planner and they start looking at your credit card bill and they start seeing Amazon, Amazon, Amazon. What are you buying at Amazon? Well, I, listen, we just, keep, we, we just keep adding things to our monthly subscription. And then they're going to say, well, this is the reason why you're in thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 worth of credit card debt. That's not healthy. I know, I know, I know. I know, I know. And so, so y'all going to make a plan. And they're going to go, you're here, but you want to be here. Do you know what that gap is? Pain. It would only stand to reason. That if we were here in our spiritual condition, we were wicked, we were evil, we were depraved. Jesus comes and saves us and positionally we are saved. Positionally we are reconciled to God, but we are still in the wilderness. We're headed towards the promised land. We are headed towards the time where there will be no more tears, where there will be no more pain, where there will be no more death. But in the middle, it's what? Pain. You getting it? Let's look at number two. The paradox of pain 
and the inward power that produces endurance. So Paul says, we know that suffering not only produces perseverance, but it also, perseverance produces character. Here's what James writes. Or he, he, Paul writes this also in 2 Corinthians. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all surpassing power is from God, not from us. We're hard pressed, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not in despair. Persecuted, not abandoned, struck down, not destroyed. And we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus might be revealed in our body. Though outwardly we are wasting away, something's happening on the inside and renewal is actually happening on the inside. And then James says, let perseverance finish its work. Now again, pain is producing perseverance. So let that perseverance produced by pain, let it finish its work so that you might be mature and complete not lacking anything. Now, as I was praying in this, and I was trying to help, because one of the things that I want, you, I want to invite you in is that when I'm studying a passage, one of the reasons why I put up these goofy charts is because I, I know that a lot of us, we're visual people. And so I'm just praying, Lord, will you give me something that will help communicate the role of pain and suffering in the life of a believer? Here's what he gave me. So remember, this is the true church moving towards maturity. Here's the process of maturity. So glory, new birth. So the moment you came to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, glory entered into your life and you became a new creature in Christ. The old was gone and the new has come. You have experienced the new birth. But then that life of new birth is produced by sacrifice and obedience in terms of maturity is produced in that new birth by sacrifice and obedience. That's the reason why Jesus says, anyone willing to come after me must deny himself, herself, pick up their cross and follow me. So the Christian life is one of sacrifice and obedience. This is also where zone two, zone three sit. It's just a long obedience in the same direction. It's a long obedience doing the spiritual disciplines. It's a long obedience reading God's word. It's a long obedience being part of the community of God. It's a long obedience in giving your time, your talents, and your treasures. It's a long obedience sharing your faith and being a good witness for Jesus. Again, that sacrificial obedience. But as you live your life, you're going to encounter pain and suffering. And the last I checked, we are going to experience it pretty much daily. Especially when you look at that list, daily. And here's what I know. When we face pain and suffering in our life as believers, we're going to utter prayers of deliverance. We're going to utter prayers of reconciliation. We're gonna utter prayers of healing. Just as I was out there praying for this family, I'm like, Lord, we know that you can supernaturally heal this woman. So will you heal her? Uh, when, when there's tension between Joni and I, I'm asking the Lord to intervene and bring unity and love in our relationship. Uh, when something is, is, is happening out in uh, the, the, the world, I, I'm praying for God to move, especially if pain and suffering, like think about it. Uh, we, we're uh, coming up on 9-11, we're asking God, I mean for uh, over 20 years we've been asking God to bring healing in the life of people who lost loved ones. Listen, this is, what, this is what believers do. We offer up prayers of deliverance and we patiently wait. And there are times where we experience glimpses of glory, where God says, yes, I'll bring healing in your life. I'll work supernaturally. I'll reconcile that marriage. I'll bring that lost son, that lost daughter back. I'll heal you financially. I'll heal you emotionally. I'll heal you mentally. So there's gonna be glimpses of glory as we utter prayers of deliverance and restoration and reconciliation and healing. And you're going to experience glimpses, but there's going to come a time in many of these areas where you and I will offer up prayers of deliverance and healing and restoration and God will say no. But I want you to know that in the glimpses of yes and in the no, he is producing glory. He's using the no's to make you more like Jesus. He's using the yes to make you more in love with Jesus. 
And that's the Christian life. And one of these days, we're going to get to a point where we're gonna ask God, and it could be when you're 40 and you just saw that you had breast, and you just found out you had breast cancer. It could be 80 and you die of old age. But you, you and I, we will face a time when we ask God to heal us, to sustain us here on planet Earth, and he will say no. And when he says no, just know that glory now will be the reality. And just so you know, Jesus went through the same process. So in John chapter one, we see that the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. And the whole idea of Jesus being the word is that he has now come to speak new creation into existence, to give birth to glory. But then what we see in his life, it was a life of sacrificial obedience to the father. Jesus did nothing outside the purview of his heavenly father. What his heavenly father told him to do, Jesus did. What his heavenly father told him to say, Jesus said. And then, and then eventually he found himself in a garden and he knew what was coming. He knew not only betrayal was coming, but the cross was coming. And in the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed a prayer of deliverance. And he said, Father, if there's any way, take this what from me? Take this cup, what, what cup? The cup of God's wrath, the cup of God's judgment, the cup of pain and suffering and torment. If there's any other way, Father, will you take this cup from me? And God the Father said, no. But in his no, we experience glory. So let this be a lesson that when God tells us no, he's doing something behind the scenes for his glory and others good. And just so that you know, this also happens with full on out human beings. Let's look at the apostle Paul. So I'll go back to that, go back to that slide though. Go back to that slide. We'll look. So Paul, glory. Uh, he was on his way to Damascus to kill, some, uh, to kill some Christians, to persecute Christians. Jesus like, I've had enough with you, Paul. Knocked him off his donkey. And says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He's like, who are you, Lord? And Jesus says, I'm, I'm Jesus of Nazareth. I'm, I'm saving you. But I'm going to show you how much you might have to suffer for my name. Because not only are you going to go to the Jews, you're actually going to go to the Gentiles. And what you see in the life of Paul is one of sacrificial obedience. But we saw his laundry list of all the pain and suffering that he has encountered as a follower of Jesus. And I'm sure that he, he offered prayers of deliverance. He offered prayers of protection. And sure, he saw glimpses of glory. But let's look at one instance where he was told no. And we find this in 2 Corinthians 12. In order to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan. I don't, I don't know, like, we don't know what a thorn in the flesh is, but uh, would you like to have a thorn in the flesh that is also called a messenger of Satan? No, I didn't think so. <laughs> because he, he, he came to torment Paul. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I'll boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses. Why? So that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake, I delight in my weaknesses. I delight in my insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties. I actually delight, Paul says, in pain and suffering. Why? Because when I am weak, then I am strong. You see, this is the paradox. Can I preach just for a moment? Can I preach for a moment? Because this is the paradox of pain in the life of God, is that when you and I face death, God is producing life. When we are wasting away, God is bringing renewal. When we are weak, God is producing strength. When we face losses in our life, God somehow, in some way, is producing wins. When we face despair, God is producing hope. When we are 
facing being crushed. God is producing formation. When we sense abandonment, God is producing communion. When we face hurt, God is producing help. When we have discouragements come in our life, God is producing encouragement. When we face disappointments in life, God is producing divine appointments. When we are powerless, God is producing power. When we face valleys, God somehow, in some way, is manufacturing mountaintops for us. When we face destruction, God is producing resurrection. And it might hurt like hell, but God's producing heaven. Thank you for letting me preach. Because we need that. That's the paradox that we're facing this, but God's producing this and he's generating this through his love, his grace, his mercy, his patience, his kindness, his compassion, his peace and his faithfulness. That's why if you are in Jesus, I don't care what you're going through. You can make it. You can. I know you don't feel like you can. I know you can't. You feel like you cannot pedal one more cycle. But in Jesus, you can. And the reason why I'm so passionate about this is because I have personally experienced in my life, almost 10 years ago, I found myself pastorless because we had a string of just, just difficult pastorates. Sure, I learned some things about how I could have led better, but just hurtful situations, hurtful pastorates, toxic churches. I was left battered and bruised, feeling abandoned. And every day when I would take my dog outside, and I say my dog because in Dallas I have all the responsibilities or at least 99% of the responsibilities in taking the dog out. So I just use it for Jesus time. Now it is interesting how my family wants another dog. I'm like, I don't need another dog. <laughs> but I would, take, I, would, I would take my dog out morning, evening. And I would just look up into the sky and I'm like, Lord, why am I here? Like, why am I hurting so bad? I mean, like, like I, I gave my life to you. Not only did I give my life to you, I, I, I gave my life to be in your, in your church to your ministry when I was 15 years old. Why is it that all I've experienced is failure after failure after failure after failure? And like, I got, a, I got a family that, I mean, church trauma is just a part of their life now. And I'm thinking, Lord, like all I've wanted to do was serve you. All I wanted to do was preach, give all that I had to preaching. All I wanted to do is love people as best as I possibly could love people. All I wanted to do was help mobilize the church for your glory and the good of the nations. That's, that's really all I wanted to do in ministry. Why in the world is it so difficult? Why in the world am I sitting here pastorless in pain, not knowing if I would ever go back into ministry? Here's the verse he shared with me. I want to know Christ. To know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings. God taught me that you cannot experience the power of Jesus' resurrection apart from participating in his suffering. And that is the call to every believer. But this is what I tell pastors anytime I have the opportunity. Is that the call to gospel ministry is a call to suffer. And I know like my family's in this room. I know that's not what they signed up for. But if we want to experience the power of Jesus' resurrection, we will have to go through suffering. And to drill down on that even more, in that suffering, we go through it with joy. Consider it pure joy. I know that people who work out, they experience what is referred to as a runner's high. 
But I, I promise you, most people who work out, they don't, they don't get up every day going, man, I can't wait to get to the gym. I'm telling you, I'm going to bust it. No, I mean, there, there are times where you know, I don't want to go for a ride. There are times I don't want to go for a run. There are times where I don't want to lift weights. I would love to do anything but that. But here's what I do know, and this is by research too that we, knew, we know this, is that when you go work out and you do exert yourself, 30 to 60 minutes later after you work out, you are on a high. There's a lot of joy in your life. There is a reduction in stress. There is a reduction in pain. That There is now this clear perspective of the world. You are just so joyful. You're like, woohoo! I can go eat me some bluebell ice cream. I can eat me a big old Whopper. I, can, I mean, I'm telling you, I am feeling on cloud nine. Why? Because in Endorphins are released when you've experienced pain. See, when we're in zone four, zone five, it's the paradox of pain, is that even though you're feeling pain, you are joyful because you know what it's producing. And then, oh, I'm gonna run into my bike. So, and here's the other thing. Here's the other thing I wanna tell you is this, is that the pain that takes place inwardly will powerfully transform what others see outwardly. You losing weight? Well, yes, I am. You see? (laughs) All that pain, all that pain is actually being demonstrated outwardly. And see, the the more pain you can let God redeem in your life, the more you're going to look like Jesus through your life. I just want to keep preaching. I just want to, yeah. That, that, that's why I truly believe, listen, church, one of the greatest missional tools we have at our disposal in the 21st century as Christians living in America is how we deal with pain and suffering. Because no one else, no one else, I'm telling you, no other religion, no other person, no other philosophy is going to teach you to deal with pain the way Jesus has taught us to deal with pain. And here's, here's truth number three, and I'm done. Here it is. Here it is. The promises that fuel us through pain as we endure to the end. So, so when you're peddling at, at zone four or zone five, what, what are the promises that fuel you? Well, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes on what is unseen since what is unseen is eternal. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, James says, because that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let me just show you five promises. And I'm just gonna leave them up. I'm not gonna explain them a lot, but I wanna put them up for you. Here's our five. When you're in zone four, zone five, and many of you, you're in zone four, zone five right now. Here are your promises. Our pain is light compared to the glory that is coming. It's light. It is like a zone one compared to glory that's coming. Our pain is momentary compared to eternity that is coming. I know it's been 10 years. I know it's been 30 years. I know you've been dealing with that for 40, 50 years. But I just want you to know that's a blip on the map compared to eternity. Our present pain is making the future of our salvation so much sweeter. Listen, some of you, you've seen depravity like I've never seen. Some of you have experienced darkness like I and others have never seen. And sure, maybe maybe we should never, but here's the thing, we live in a fallen world because we jacked it up. But but you've experienced so much of the depravity that you're like, it would make your skin crawl. But here's what I want you to know is that whatever you have experienced, the depths of depravity or whatnot, actually will make glory that much sweeter. God is capturing our tears and will one day wipe them from our eyes. Here's what the the, the psalmist David says. You keep track of all of my sorrows, all of my pain. You have collected all of my tears in your bottle. And I think it's going to be at the very end in Revelation 21 when he will wipe every tear from our eyes. What I think he's going to do, is he's going to pour out the bottle and say, no more tears, no more tears. So those tears that you're crying right now, those pillowcases that have been saturated in your tears, I want you to know 
God's bottling them up because one day he's gonna wipe every tear from our eyes. And then God will one day answer all of our prayers of deliverance once and for all with a mighty, mighty, resounding, eternal yes. So here's my takeaways for you about pain and endurance. Don't fight against the pain, fight in it and through it. Don't shake your fist at God, because here's what I know. We, we, we like to try to blame somebody when we experience pain and suffering. God, wife, boss. But instead of shaking your fist, raise your hands and praise. Don't reject pain. Let God redeem it. Reframe the pain, because we know that fire forges faith. Suffering strengthens salvation, and pain produces perseverance in the hands of our great God and King. Let's pray. Father, I know there are people right now just being in zone four, zone five. And they need you to show up. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, I'm gonna ask church leaders to come up here to the front because I know some of you, you need, to pray, you need to be prayed for and over in your season of pain. And so I'm gonna invite you here in just a second when Pastor Marsh begins to sing. And the song that we're singing is actually taken from Job, where Job had lost everything, lost his health, lost his business, lost his house, lost all of his, his kids. All he was left with was a nagging wife. They said, curse God and die. And he utters these words, though God slay me, though God ruin me, I will trust in him. So we're gonna sing this song, but if you need someone to pray over you, they will be up here at the front as we conclude this gathering with praising him. Father, move in a mighty way. Amen. I come, God, I come. Return to the Lord, the one who's broken, the one who's torn me apart. You struck down to bind me up. You say you do it all in love, that I might know you suffering and though you slay me yet I will praise you though you take from me I will bless your name and though you ruin me still I will worship sing a song for the one who's all I need Though my flesh may fail The earth below give way And with my eyes, with my eyes I see the Lord Lifted high upon that day Behold the lamb that was slain All I know And every tear was worth it all And though you slay me Yet I will praise you Though you take from me I will bless your name And though you Sing a song to the one who's all I need. Stand with me. We're going to sing this out one, one last time. If you need prayer, come, come, come forward. But listen to what we're singing. Though you slay me. Though you ruin me. I still worship you. Some reasonable. 
so unrational. And the reason why it's unreasonable and irrational is because we serve an unreasonable and irrational God. This is one of the areas that makes us distinct. That though he slay me, yet we will trust. Let's sing it one last time. continue to just play softly as people are being ministered to but I want to give you the benediction that you might be sent out Father may you have your face shine on us your glorious face may your peace fill us that peace that surpasses all understanding and may your spirit the spirit of the living God the spirit that possesses the power to resurrect. May he fuel us in these seasons of zone four and zone five for your glory and others' good. Church, you are sent out to be the salt and light of the earth. <laughs>